Hi and welcome. This tutorial is the penultimate video in a series of videos on C Sharp file handling and will focus on using memory streams in C Sharp. This video is also the penultimate video in this C Sharp for Beginners course. Once this C Sharp for Beginners course has been released in its entirety, this channel will create and release a free advanced C Sharp course. So please consider subscribing and ring the bell so that you can be notified of future content. Right, so I think the best way to traverse the subject matter is through a code example. So let's create a .NET Core console app and name it Memory Stream Example. I'm going to keep the code example really basic so that we can get a general understanding of how to read data from a memory stream as well as write data to a memory stream. So before we start coding, let's answer the question, why would a developer use a memory stream as a store of data rather than a file, for example? As always, it depends on the requirement associated with the relevant project. But there is an overall advantage when using a memory stream instead of a file to store data, and this is the speed advantage. Reading data from a file and writing data to a file is going to involve reading data from a disk drive or writing data to a disk drive, which can be far slower than reading that same data from a memory stream or writing that same data to a memory stream. An example of a requirement associated with using memory streams could be that you may wish to perform an interim process like encrypting data before, for example, sending data to a network stream. You may wish to decrypt the data before inserting it into a database. Another example could be that you may wish to move a particularly large file from one location on a network to another location on a network. Using memory streams can allow the developer to write code to divide the file up into blocks of bytes. Data in the file can be incrementally loaded into memory and processed. Rather than loading the entire file into RAM and processing this huge amount of data all at once. So a memory stream can be used for the sake of improved efficiency. So in this example we are going to create one employee record and save it to a memory stream in Unicode format. We are then going to write code to read the employee data from the memory store and write its contents to the console screen. We'll then promote our employee by updating two of the fields stored in our memory stream, namely the salary field and the is manager field. So you may be asking, what is the point of using memory streams when we could just store the employee record in an employee object derived from a class? While the meaning of storing data in an object derived from a class is completely different to storing that same data in a memory stream. A memory stream is a data store and does not have any meaning on its own. It is literally just a series of bytes stored in memory, whereas an object derived from an employee class contains information about an employee, each field discreetly stored as data of an appropriate data type. A memory stream can be used as just another backing store for data as if it were a file or a database. It obviously can't replace a file or a database as a storage facility, but it is appropriate to store data in this way when the data only needs to be persisted temporarily. Caching data in memory can result in a performance advantage. So let's carry on with our example. Let's first create 12 constants. Our employee record will have six fields, ID, first name, last name, salary, gender, and is manager. So here we are creating two constants for each field. As we get further into this example, the significance of these constants will become apparent, but for now you can think of these values as locations and demarcations for where these fields reside in our memory stream and the size constraint imposed on each of the fields within our memory stream. As you can infer by the name of the constants, each pair of constants is mapped to a particular employee field. One contains the offset location from the beginning of the memory stream and the other contains the size constraint imposed on the relevant field within the memory stream. And the last constant we'll create stores the size of the employee record, which is the sum 
of the fixed lengths of the employee fields that will be stored in our memory stream. So in our main method, I'm first going to create an object of type Unicode encoding. This class is a member of the system.txt namespace. So we need to include the appropriate directive at the top of our code. Let's create a memory stream object and pass the record length constant into its constructor. The argument passed into the memory streams constructor is used for the purpose of establishing the size of our memory stream. The memory stream class is part of the system.io namespace. So let's include a directive to this namespace at the top of our code. Let's create a method responsible for inserting an employee record into our memory stream. Let's name this method seed data. So you can see we are creating an employee record as a string and then using the Unicode object's getBytes method to return the string as a byte array. We are then writing the byte array stored in the variable named employee data to our memory stream. The reason we are passing the calculated value of the field's length in bytes denoted by the relevant constants we created when we first started creating the sample application divided by two is because each Unicode character requires 16 bits or two bytes of storage capacity. Our memory stream is storing our string representing the employee record in Unicode format. For more information on Unicode, please navigate to the following URL. Let's write a method named getField, which is responsible for reading a particular field from our memory stream. We are using the seek method on our memory stream object to point to the correct location in memory containing the value of the relevant employee field. We can then read the field's value into a byte array. We now need to convert the byte array to an array of chars. So let's write another method for this purpose. Let's name this method return char array from byte array. Okay, let's go back to the getField method and create a new string object and pass the returned char array into its constructor. Let's return the string value to the calling code. In the main method, let's call the seedData method. Let's then use the seek method on the memory stream object to point to the beginning of our memory stream. Let's write an appropriate heading to the console screen. Let's then write code to read the employee record from our memory stream and display the record's field values to the console screen. Right, let's test the code. That looks pretty good, but there's a little problem. The isManager field value should be false, but we are currently only seeing FAL on the console screen for this field value. And the problem is that the isManager length constant has been set to a value of 6 and should have been set to a value of 16, so let's fix this. It is important to correctly establish the length values and the offset values relating to specific data within the overall binary data store in order to accurately process the specific data. Let's run the code again.
and that looks good. So let's promote our employee. Let's write code to update the employee's salary, and let's also write code to update the is manager field. So let's write a reusable method named update field that can be used to update both the salary field and the is manager field. Okay, let's finish off writing the code in our main method. Let's run the code. When the user presses any key, our code promotes the employee to manager and adds 20,000 to the employee's salary. Great. I want to also demonstrate that we can create an overload for the getField method. In this version of the getField method, instead of positioning the pointer, and using the offset parameter to point to the location of the relevant field, we can use the current position and the length value to retrieve the relevant field. We can do this because each time the read method is called on our memory stream object, the pointer advances by the length of the previously read data. So you can see that we are passing the current enum value instead of the begin enum value into our seek method in this version of the getField method. In our main method, we can remove the offset argument when we call the getField method, and this will work just as before, only we are traversing the fields within our memory stream in a slightly different way. Let's run the code. Great. I hope you have enjoyed this video on handling memory streams in C Sharp. For more detailed information on memory streams in C Sharp, please navigate to the following URL. If you feel you have benefited from viewing this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please feel free to share this video with anyone you feel may benefit from its content. There is now only one more video that needs to be released for the completion of this C Sharp for Beginners course. Tutorials relating to advanced C-Sharp concepts will then be released as part of a C-Sharp advanced course. So please consider subscribing and ring the bell so that you can be notified of the release of upcoming tutorials. Your comments are of course welcome. Please feel free to download the code created in this video from GitHub. As always, a link to the appropriate repository is available below in the description. The next and final video in this series on file handling and indeed on the C Sharp for Beginners course, we'll focus on the File System Watcher class. Thank you and take care.